I'm a relatively uh, new member here at this church, and I am not sitting up in front today for three reasons. Number one, why would I want to sit up front alone when I could sit next to my beautiful wife? <laughs> Number two, I wanted to show that I am on the same journey that you're on. I'm just a member here. I'm not on staff. And the third reason that I didn't sit up there is I'm retired and I can do what I want. <laughs> You see, the other option is to stand here to preach. And of course, this is good because you have a greater visibility. But let me tell you what happened to me as a young minister. There was a church just down the street. It was our closest neighbor. I was the pastor of a Presbyterian church in a small community. And this new church started up. It was a black church. I had never gone. I knew their services were a lot longer than ours. And they sent out a letter to every pastor in town, and they said, Dear Pastor, would you come on this coming Sunday night and spend the evening with us in a celebration service for our fifth anniversary of the birth of our church? And so I did. And when I arrived at the church, I noticed there were no other pastors that answered the call. There was only me. And so we went into the pastor's study and he took me aside and said, well, now you have an hour to preach. <laughs> well, I told him, that's not how it works. <laughs> when you're a Presbyterian pastor, you spend a full eight hours crafting an eight-page document with every word written down that you're going to say. And then from that document, you extrapolate an outline and you take that outline into the pulpit with you, and from that you preach your sermon. 20 minutes, that's it. So the pastor looked at me, and I was the only white person in the church, and the pastor looked at me and he said, well, brother, let the Lord do a great thing for you tonight. <laughs> he did. I tell you, the freedom that I had in preaching that night was unbelievable. And I made a great discovery that night. I discovered that that big, bulky pulpit that most churches have right there is just an impediment between the preacher and the people. And that was a great discovery. And I, I continued to prepare, but I didn't go into the service with the same attitude. I knew that God could do something marvelous if I would just give over my heart to the Holy Spirit, and it worked every time. Well, you see, it was many years ago that I was, I was 21 years old that I went off to a college science camp, the college that I was going to, and we were divided up into dish crews, and working crews and cleaning crews, and the first night I showed up at my station that I was assigned to the end of the line where we took the hot dishes and glasses out of the trays from the machine and put them away, and there was this young lady also assigned to the same task, and she had a beautiful robin's egg blue sweatshirt on, and she was really pretty, and I walked up to her, and I didn't even say anything to her. But the minute I saw her, I knew that that was the girl that I was going to marry. And it, it wasn't like a voice, but it was a knowledge, a certain knowledge that came to me, and I knew that that was her, but you know what? I didn't tell her. I thought, boy, that's one way to look like a creep. <laughs> so I kept it a secret. I didn't tell her that for a long time, right, dear? <laughs> it's been 54 years since. There was a man attending the classes as a student, 66 years old, farmer who had just retired from South Dakota. He had a sad story to tell. As a young man, he was called into the ministry. He called it a sacred calling, and he didn't respond. And it wasn't because he didn't want to respond, 
But it just seemed that he never could respond. He worked on the farm, and his dad became crippled, and he had to run the farm himself. And then first you know, he was married and had, had children, and they had a lot of children, and then they had to keep running the farm, and he couldn't get away. And so now he's 66, filled with remorse, terribly worried about what's going to happen when he dies and faces his maker, and he didn't answer the call. Well, I was 21, and I was wrestling with my own call. So I really listened to what he said. Now I'm retired. Many years have passed since then, and I have some thoughts about that. I've had a lot of time. I've had eight years of retirement. I'm 78. I retired at 70. I've had eight years to think about Tom, to think about my calling, to think about work in general, and I want to share with you the conclusions that I've come to. The first thing is that the calling of a preacher is a real calling. And it is sacred. And boy, is it a lot of work when you go to seminary. I went to Fuller. Pastor Steve went to Fuller. Pastor Lowell Linden went to Fuller. And you could ask any of them. They'll tell you the same thing. The way that Fuller got its name. At the end of the first week, you suddenly realize that your schedule has become a lot fuller. <laughs> and you're so busy. And what a job it is to get through, through three years of seminary. Well, one of our own has answered the call. Julio, would you come up here? Stand, stand right here. In fact, stand right there. This is even better. This young man is going to struggle <laughs> through <laughs> all kinds of courses. And I want to share with Julio the words that I was given when I entered the first day by a, pro a wise professor who said this, when... when when things are dark, when you're discouraged here at Fuller, I want you to remember these words. This too will pass. <laughs> now, when then I was a young minister, my kids were little, they're in their 50s now, and they conspired with my wife to make this stool. This is my children's sermon stool. It took a lot of practice wearing my robe to be able to put the pastoral uh, seat right there and stay upright, but I did. I never fell over backward once. And so now I want to present my stool, which is still good to go, to Julio for his children's sermons. Thank you. Okay, but what you got to do, it's a lot harder when you try it with a robe on. <laughs> so I looked in the scripture in these last weeks when Steve asked me to, to speak today, and I'm honored to speak here. I'm honored for several reasons. One is that this is such a historic place. Can you imagine the generations of people who have been in these services who have listened to sermons. Can you imagine the ministers, row upon row of them, who have served this church and done their task and met their calling? And here we are in this beautiful sanctuary. If you go into the church office, you'll see the television is set right up here, looking here. It looks like a movie set. It's so beautiful. And you get the opportunity of being here every week as well. So what I did in terms of finding something about work and something about calling, because I want to relate the idea of a sacred calling to our daily work. And that is in this passage in Colossians, where we end up with, with a, starting out with a list of qualifications of what it really takes to be a Christian. Now, I didn't become a Christian until I was 16 years of age. It was through great tragedy in my life that I began to to read in the scripture at age 14 to find out if there was a God, that God really exists. I didn't know. My parents never took me to church. We were a non-churched family. And when I was 16, I made the discovery that God was alive through Jesus Christ and that I believed. And that, so now I have this, this um, 
special view that I know what it's like to live without faith, and I know what it's like to live with faith. And that, that was the very drive, I think, that drove me into the ministry, to be able to share that, to try to be able to share the faith, that living faith that I found. I noted in talking to Julio that he served university at the University of Redlands. I did as well at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And Pastor John, meeting in our building right behind with his young church, he served university in a university in Russia. Isn't that amazing? We're all doing the same work, the work of sharing our faith because we sense the calling. So let's go over first these qualifications. It says here that the qualifications for being, I could say, a believer, but also being called to a work, not necessarily the work of preaching, but to a work the qualifications are having compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Wow. Just think what a good plumber a person would make <laughs> if they had these three, these five qualities. What a good employee. To, have you ever worked for a boss that you didn't like? Boy, that's one of the lessons of life, right? To be able to get along with someone that you don't really like. Well, if you have compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, it becomes a whole lot easier to get along. But what's it like in daily life? For whatever we do, we've got these qualifications to be a Christian, which I think are qualifications for any job. Are we always like that? Sometimes life becomes comedy. And I want to tell you one of the funniest moments in my life. As a young person, we were married and had, let's see, we had um, two children then. One was eight years old, the oldest. One was six, two daughters. We decided to participate in Fuller Seminary's Summer in Israel program. Ten weeks. The first two weeks were in Athens in Greece. And we had classes and got credits and studied there, and it was an incredible experience for young people. And after a couple of days in the hotel that the seminary had chosen, I was just done with it because it had no air conditioning. It was terribly hot. And so I set off on a journey one morning to find a better hotel. And I found one. It was only a mile away. It was brand new. It had air conditioning. It cost a few dollars less a day. And so I made the arrangements with the seminary to, because we had paid a, a, a blanket payment and covered all the hotel for them to cover that. And so I set off then in the afternoon with a large luggage cart from the new hotel to go to the old hotel and get the luggage. Well, we were young then, and we, we didn't travel. We hadn't traveled. We didn't know anything about packing light, and we had these children. So you go for 10 weeks. I mean, do you think we had a lot of luggage? <laughs> so there I am with the luggage piled up so high that I couldn't see over in front. And I'm pushing the car through the streets of Athens like this and trying to look to the side, and I had our oldest daughter, who was eight years old, on the other side trying to guide me through the streets of Athens. And would you believe I got lost? I came to an intersection where six streets came together. So all the corners were like pieces of pie. And right on one corner, we came right down the sidewalk. To, a man had a little shop. I think he sold luggage. And he was out there on the street, and he, was, he had a, a feather duster, and he was dusting it off. And he was bending over, dusting it off. And I came up from behind, and I didn't see him. And I plowed right into him. Oh, was there an uproar. I tried to apologize, but he was yelling something in Greek that didn't sound very nice. And so we, we just took off. We're still lost. 20 minutes later, I know it's hard to believe, but 20 minutes later, I'm coming down the other street of the piece of pie. 
and his store is still on the corner. And luck would have it, there he is on now working on this side, dusting off his suitcases. And yes, he's bending over, and I ran into him again, and oh my, what do you say to that? We, I said to my daughter, who's eight years old, I said, split, and we just took off running and pushing the cart as fast as we could to get away. But where's compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness, and where is patience in those kinds of comic instances? Well, that's part of living. That's just the way that we live our lives. There's sometimes a little bit of comedy in there. It doesn't mean because we have these qualifications that we're going to be always so serious as Christians. It's, it's okay to laugh if you're a Christian. Then there are some actions that the writer gives us here. Actions for Christians. What should we be doing? Well, we should be bearing one another's burdens. Does anyone in this church have any burdens? You bet. Every person sitting here today has some burdens. Some are really heavy. And also it says here we are to forgive one another as we have been forgiven. And that's a tall order sometimes, but we can do it because we have God's help in doing that. And whether we're talking about being a Christian or whether we're talking about being a real estate agent, or whether we're talking about being a doctor, whatever, we can do it. My mother was a realtor. She was a, a, a wonderful Christian lady. And one time she sold a house to a minister and he promised her a commission. He didn't sign the paper and then he wouldn't give it to her. And that broke her heart. Because here was somebody who should have known better than to do that. So how we live our lives as Christians and how we work are one and the same. That when you do your job, you must be able to do these things, to bear one another's burdens, to forgive your fellow employee or whoever it is. And then the crowning thing is to bind it all together in love. Because love is the cement. Love is the thing that makes it all go around. Well, you know, my wife and I have lived together now for, I mean, that sounds bad. We've been married for 54 <laughs> years. <laughs> for 54 years. And you know what has bound us together? It's this idea of bearing each other's burdens. When she's hurting, I'm hurting. The idea of forgiving each other, you think that's hard to do? You bet. I know how to get her mad. I know what her buttons are. I could get her so angry in just a minute, you wouldn't believe it. She'd fly off the handle. And same for me. She knows exactly what would make me get mad. But we support each other. And what binds it all together is love. And it's the same thing with work. Whatever it is that you do. A friend of mine is an anesthesiologist, so he told me this joke. An anesthesiologist called the plumber. The plumber came and worked 10 minutes, banged on the pipes, and said that'll be $1,800. And the anesthesiologist said, I, I don't make that much money as an anesthesiologist. And the plumber said, well, I didn't make that mu much when I was an anesthesiologist. <laughs> Whatever we do, even in the building, if we're in business, even in the billing and the handling of money, we've got to do these actions that are called for as Christians, called for as plumbers, called for at, at whatever it is that you do. Now, when we were married, I know this sounds strange, but there, there actually was a large segment of the population of people where the mother st stayed home and was a mom and didn't work. You don't see that very much today. We tried to do that, and we were able to do that until they got old enough for school, and then my wife started working part-time until they came home, and then when they were in school longer, she worked longer and finally had her full, full career as an RN. I know a couple where, right now, the, the lady is a medical doctor, an obstetrician, and her husband is the stay-home mom, and he loves it. It works perfectly for them. He does all the cooking, the washing, the baking. He does it all, cleaning. And that's fine. 
even the person who is the house dad or the house mom has a sacred calling, the calling of God, the calling of God to use these qualifications given compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And when I think of my mother, that's exactly what I think of. So this is not something that we only say that the minister has a sacred calling. Every person who is a believer in Jesus Christ has a calling because God has given them something to do. Well, we had this very famous alumni. He was a professor at the Lamont Geophysical Observatory of Columbia University. And he was on the cutting edge and one of the premier thinkers about global drift, continental drift, and the idea that the continents had drifted apart. That came into being right in the late 50s and the early 60s. So this famous man consented to come back to our little college and give us a talk. And of course, here we are students. We're, we're all interested in, uh, you know, how can I find God's will? I mean, one of, one of my friends, Cliff, every day before he got dressed, he would kneel down in front of his closet and he would pray, oh God, show me what clothes to put on today. I want to wear the clothes that are your will. Well, that would have driven me nuts. <laughs> so I told them in my brashness, well, God doesn't care what you wear, just put something on. He didn't like that at all. So here's this famous professor. Here are we are students all stretched out about how, how are you going to know when you meet the right one? How do you know that she's the right one? How do you know that he's the right one? How do you know what job to take? Should, should I major in this or major in that? Wow. So they asked him, how do you find God's will? And you know what he said? Mm. He said, well, he said, it's all like you're in a bus station. And the buses are rolling in. This one says RN. Well, some people get on that one. And this one says real estate agent. Some people get on that one. And it doesn't matter. You can get on any bus you want. Well, we thought about that. And in the succeeding weeks, there was a huge uproar on the part of the administration over that because that wasn't the way the administration of the college pictured it. But I think he was on to something in this sense. That if you miss your bus... It's okay to take another bus. You don't have to be like Tom and just pine away and worry yourself about what's going to happen. What's going to happen when I get to heaven and I didn't answer the call? Oh, I know what's going to happen. The Lord's going to say to Tom, you good, you good and faithful servant, because you don't have to be a minister to have a calling. Now, let's bring it up to time. Let's bring it up to being retired. You know, about being retired, I didn't want to retire. It wasn't my idea, I honestly. Was, but the Lord absolutely shut me down. And I knew that that was it, that the church needed someone else after 21 years. I started the church, had grown immensely. We had a, a, a campus worth a million and a half dollars, all paid for. It was booming. What a time to leave. But God told me to leave, and I did. I was worried about it, though. What am I going to do? I met this man bicycling about 15 years ago in Palm Springs, and he was sitting on the bench, and he was so miserable because he had retired. And he told me never to retire. He'd lost his job. He'd lost his calling. He, he had nothing to do. So I retired. It's been the most wonderful eight years of my life. Retirement is really wonderful. Now, not that any of you are old enough to be retired. <laughs> but if you are, it's a wonderful time. It's a wonderful time for you. But during this time that you're retired, you still need to meet these qualifications of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You need to bear with each other. You need to forgive each other. And you need to wrap your whole life in love. And if you do that, you'll have a wonderful retirement. I wish that for each one of you. And I wish Julio the very best. He's just starting out. 
the great adventures in faith that he's going to have, the great privilege of being a pastor, the privilege of having people share their lives with you, share their joys and their sorrows, and be able to pray with them and to see them grow in the Lord. It's an unbelievable privilege. So in my retirement, I'm filled with gratitude for what I did. I miss it, yes, but I'm so excited. Every day I can get up and do what I like. We've been traveling like crazy. My life has taken off in directions that I didn't even know it would after I retired. I'm doing things now that I'm just amazed at. My family's amazed at because I hadn't anticipated that. God is good. Let us pray.